So now as we continue our look through the digestive pathway, we'll entitle this next flowchart Digestive Pathway 2. And what we're going to be focusing on is the next compartment of the digestive system. We've looked at the oral cavity where ingestion begins and a bit of digestion also begins. That led to the pharynx where we have the swallowing and then from the pharynx we have the esophagus which is a muscular tube that leads down into the stomach. The stomach is therefore the fourth compartment of our pathway of digestion and that's what we'll be focusing on in this next flowchart, the stomach. The stomach is visually represented in figure 41.11 and this figure is a nice summative figure of everything we'll be talking about in this flowchart as it shows the stomach and its various secretions. The stomach is a very, very good organ at secreting things that are involved in digestion. Let's take a look at how that happens. Now, beginning with the stomach, what we need to understand is a bit of its structure. And its structure contains very elastic walls. This is useful because you have experienced this probably, the fact that your stomach is capable of stretching. At some times you feel your stomach more full, let's say, than others, and at other times you may not feel the elasticity that's within the stomach. This is very important because when you have elastic walls that are also um, with many folds, and as we know, folds are always going to be structures that are very good at increasing surface area, increasing that surface area to volume ratio. When you have this combination, what you allow the stomach to do is expand and this is really useful. This allows for the expansion of the stomach, meaning that the stomach has the capability to hold about two liters of substances, so a two liter capacity. And this is what allows the stomach to expand. These elastic walls and the folds within them are going to allow for this expansion. And for that reason, you have this capability of the stomach for because of its elastic walls, because of its capacity, it can store an entire meal. Maybe even one or two, depending on its actual size. It can store an entire meal. Now, what use is that? This is useful because now what we as humans, as heterotrophs, as animals don't have to do is that we don't have to constantly eat. Now, you might be wondering, oh, I thought we always have to eat all the time, and that's how we survive. Yes, but in terms of constantly, what I'm stating here is that we don't have to eat every second of our lives. There are moments that we do eat, and then we are satiated. We are full. We have this feeling of fullness for a decent amount of time, several hours even, before we need to eat again. This is all because the stomach can expand while it's eating or in preparation or during the digestive process and store an entire meal. It's only when this entire meal has been completely digested and absorbed do we hear our stomach growling. We feel our stomach churning when there's nothing to churn. That's when we have that feeling of hunger. But this doesn't come all the time to us. It happens at certain intermittent periods of the day, and therefore we don't have to constantly eat. We have this capability of holding things within the stomach for a decent amount of time to keep us full. So, and that's the story of the stomach structure. Another thing I want to look at about the stomach is its secretions. And the stomach secretions can be all understood by understanding and taking a look at its lining. So much of the digestive system involves secretions, right? Exocrine gland secretions. Those are usually going to come from the linings of the various compartments. The stomach is no exception to that rule. In terms of the stomach lining and its overall structure, what you should notice is that its lining is not completely smooth. So it does not have a very smooth lining, but instead it actually has pits. Pits are just going to be indentations of the stomach. There's going to be these, you're going to see that if you look at the stomach and its interior basically, you see these pits. And the reason for these pits is exactly what you would think. These are tubes, these are ducts, and they're going to lead into what are known as tubular, think of these as ducts, gastric, gastric refers to the stomach, gastric glands. So we have glands that are going to utilize ducts in the form of these pits. So what are they going to do? Of course, they're going to secrete substances through the tubes, through these gastric glands, and that will be the secretion of gastric juice. So they exocrinely secrete gastric juice, 
And this is going to be a substance that's very good at digesting and breaking down things. This is going to also be a very acidic substance, as we'll see a little bit later on. So that's our basic story of the stomach lining. The initial story, at least. We have gastric juice that's all throughout the stomach because the lining of the stomach contains these pits that exocrinely secrete that gastric juice. Okay, there are also other things that are going to be secreted. The stomach secretes a lot of stuff. And the other things will be secreted by separate structures. Namely, let's say, something like the mucus cells. Notice the spelling of mucus here. It has C-U-O-S as the ending. Mucus cells will secrete what you think. Mucus. They secrete exactly what you think, but again, notice the spelling here. M-U-C-U-S. When mucus is spelled like this, it is referring to an adjective. Okay? This is a description of the types of cells that secrete mucus. The secretion of a thing called mucus, this is referred to as the noun version of mucus. So if something is mucus-like, it's like mucus, secretes mucus, it's an adjective, therefore it's the mucus cells, and they secrete a thing called mucus, a noun called mucus, that's why we spell it like this. So that's just a bit of a differentiation to be aware of. So mucus cells will secrete mucus, their purpose is to protect the lining of the mouth, of the, not the mouth, of the stomach in this situation. Again, there's going to be lots of these hydrolytic enzymes all throughout digestion, and you want to protect yourself from eating yourself, from digesting yourself. So you protect the lining by secreting this mucus, so much so that this is happening every three days. There's a completely new lining every three days in your stomach because you're, for, for, for the most part, eating every day and you're churning every day, gastric juice is being made every day, and thus a new lining needs to be formed every day to make sure your stomach is protected. That's very soft tissue lining that we've seen before. So those are the mucus cells. The stomach lining will also contain things known as chief cells. So this is a separate type of cell found within the lining. Chief cells will secrete an enzyme, a precursor, I should say, called pepsinogen. Keyword is pepsinogen, okay? This is going to be an inactive, it does not work, it does not do anything. It's an inactive precursor to the enzyme known as pepsin. So later on, pepsinogen will be converted to pepsin, but for right now, the chief cells, as just a regular old chief cell, will secrete pepsinogen, and it will not be able to do anything. It is inactive precursor, that should say precursor right here, to pepsin. Okay, those are the chief cells and then the stomach lining will also contain one final group of cells called parietal cells. What are their purpose? Parietal cells will contain many ATP pumps. And if you remember, ATP pumps, they're very good at pumping out protons. These ATP pumps will therefore put H plus protons into the stomach lumen. That's basically the empty space of the stomach. Okay, once this has been done, this H plus will actually combine with a separate ion, completely different ion, called chloride, chloride ion. It combines with Cl minus. Cl minus is also going to be secreted by or produced by the parietal cells in a separate process. But just know that in the lumen, it will combine with the Cl minus that's also already there. And when you combine H plus and Cl minus, what do you get? This is going to form HCl. This forms HCl. HCl is one of the most naturally occurring, most acidic substances ever. It has a pH equal to 2. That's a very, very low pH. And when you have a very, very low pH, you have a very, very, very acidic component, compound, whatever it may be. So overall, what can you state about the stomach contents? The stomach contents, including gastric juice, including the HCL, all of this is going to create a very acidic environment. Therefore, all of the enzymes that work in the stomach, the hydrolytic enzymes that are doing digestion, they prefer a very low pH, and this is very rare to see in the body. The body has a pH of about 7 or 8 in between there. Everything else about the body is about neutral. Here we have a very acidic environment, so it's worth noting why and how it comes through the parietal cells. Speaking of this acidic environment, let's conclude by looking at HCl and what its role is. HCl has two major roles. The first role is that it is an antimicrobial um, chem chemical substance. It can kill foreign invaders. 
And it does this because it kills most bacteria, most bacteria, not all, most bacteria that is digested with food. Almost every time you eat anything, the chances, there are, is a high likelihood that there is some form of bacteria on that food, no matter how safe or clean you may think it is. But the thing is, the HCL within the stomach acts as a sort of defense barrier that will kill any of that bacteria, most of the bacteria, um, so long as it can destroy it through this HCL very acidic uh, environment. So it acts as an antimicrobial com component of the stomach. Now, the most important thing I should think uh, that you should understand about HCL is its role with pepsinogen. We stated that pepsinogen is inactive. It has to become active somehow. HCL will be critical in doing that, act, in, uh, that activation process. This is how it does it. HCL as a compound, when it mixes with pepsinogen, which is also within the stomach, both of these compounds will react. And HCL will remove a short part of the pepsinogen. Remember, pepsinogen is inactive. It cannot do anything. Polypeptide chain. PPC for polypeptide chain. Polypeptide chain simply means that pepsinogen is in a primary association. Remember, proteins can be primary, secondary, tertiary, or quaternary. But pepsinogen just has a primary, primary arrangement of polypeptides. A short part of it will be removed. Okay, why is that short part removed? Well, once that short part is removed by HCL, this is going to reveal the enzyme active site. If you remember, when an enzyme needs to do its job, it needs to combine with a substrate at the active site. Now that the active site is available, it's open, it's ready, we have essentially activated pepsinogen. And when we have activated pepsinogen through HCL, we're now going to have a very active enzyme called pepsin. Notice what we said before. Pepsinogen is an inactive precursor. It's the thing before the actual active pepsin. So once we have this active site available and open, we have created an activated pepsin. So pepsin is our active enzyme. This is the main digestive enzyme of the stomach. The main thing that the stomach is good at digesting, therefore, is actually proteins because pepsin serves as a proteolytic enzyme. It breaks down lysis proteins, proteolytic enzyme. And it does this, we can state that right over here just to remind ourselves, this breaks down protein the same old way you imagine most other substances are broken down. But it utilizes a specific com uh, component or activity called endopeptidase. It acts as what is known as an endopeptidase. So take a look here. We have an active site revealed that makes pepsin active. Pepsin is a proteolytic enzyme. It will break down proteins by being an endopeptidase. What is an endopeptidase? Endo means on the interior, and then we're looking at a peptide, a polypeptide chain, like, let's say, something that you've consumed. You've consumed a polypeptide chain. You've consumed protein. You're going to use the pepsin endopeptidase activity to do the following. It will break internal, that's the name endopeptidase, it will break internal peptide bonds. So basically cut proteins in half because they are usually long structures, polypeptide chains, and you can just cut an internal protein and make that protein into a smaller polypeptide. And that's exactly what we do through an endopeptidase. This creates smaller polypeptides. Notice though, it does not create amino acids. Okay? That's going to be done later in a separate part of the uh, separate part of digestion. So we do not create not amino acids, okay? So these smaller polypeptides, though they're small, they're still not able to be taken in by cells. Only The cells can really only take up amino acids. We'll break them down further, the smaller polypeptides, in a later part of the digestive pathway. And that covers our look at the stomach.